Okay, welcome to the WPIAL Blitz Show. My name is Bruce Badgley. There's my buddy Ian McMeans. And Ian, uh, we've got a very special uh, guest to start our show this evening. Why don't you introduce him to everybody? We do. We have Aliquippa head coach Mike Warfield. We are honored to have him on our show. Aliquippa, as everyone should know who has watched the show for a while, defending Whippeo and PIAA 4A champions. Um, coach Warfield has guided the Quips to two state championships uh, in his four years. This is his fifth year with the program, which doubled their state championships uh, total that they had in school history. So, Coach, to start off, that's a pretty cool accomplishment to double the number of state titles that Aliquippa has had during your tenure there. Um, you know, talk about what that means to you in the community. Um, when I, you know, when I took the position, you know, five years ago now, I, I didn't even think that far ahead. Um, my objective was just to give back to the community and to the program that's meant so much to me. Um, but looking back on it, you know, briefly reflecting on it a little bit, you know, I give all the credit to the kids. I mean, you can't win state championships or whip your championships without the players. Um, then I also give all the credit to my assistant head coaches who have done a phenomenal job. I really didn't change much once I became on the head coach to staff. The staff is basically the same as it was um, for Coach Piana. Just a couple changes where I, I hired my one of my good friends, Shelton Colbert, as the offensive coordinator. Um, but besides that, we basically had the same staff as, as prior years. So, you know, all the credit goes to them. I always say, no matter who the coach was or who the coach is now, which is me or who the coach will be in the future, I think the backbone of the program is the assistant coaches. So um, I give them the majority of the credit. Yeah. And actually, that was something I wanted to ask you about. When you came in, there was some philosophical changes on offense with the, you know, opening up the passing game a bit forever. Aliquippa had been known for their sort of ground and pound, run it on first down, second down, third down, and if we have to, fourth down approach. Um, and, and you really brought in some, you know, the air warfield offense to, to open things up. Um, you know, how, how did that go, you know, not just at the high school level, but, you know, we've talked to a lot of coaches on the show that say it's really important to get a similar offensive philosophy down into the youth levels. So, um, you know, how did that go kind of changing the whole offensive culture of the Aliquippa program, which has always had a very strong youth program as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, it wasn't as difficult as you, it might seem because, you know, for years, um, everyone wanted Aliquippa to be more open because of the talent we have on the outside. Um, so it, it wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be. Um, it did, you know, it takes time to, to get where you need to be as far as time and, and spacing is concerned. Um, but overall, um, it, it's, it's been a good change. Um, I learned basically the offense from when I was at Central Valley under Mark Lyons. Um, it's the similar offense, same offense, basically the same language at times. Um, but it it's basically was the same that I took from, took from Mark. But you know, I always say this, you know, we, we want to be spread and, and get our athletes the ball in space. Um, but when it comes down to stretch, when they get in November and, you know, early de December, hopefully, you got to be able to run the ball. And especially in 4A, if you can't run the ball, you can't win. Um, so, and not only just that, just the, you never know what the weather condition is going to be um, in Western PA and Pennsylvania period, as far as when late November comes, it might be snowing, it might be raining, windy. Um, so you might not have that opportunity um, to throw the ball as much as you would like. So that run game travels. So we always focus on, yeah, although we spread it out at times, but, you know, the basis and the foundation of our offense is, is that run game. Well, you're the one that brought it up. So uh, I'm just going to, like, uh, take off with this topic, too, and that is, you know, there's got to be a lot of emotions, you know, going through, you know, your mind here as you uh, face off against, you know, Central Valley uh, this week. But, also in that, you know, ultimately, uh, likely a, a Whippeal championship is going to have to roll through Central Valley, you know, as well. So talk a little bit about the emotions of going back and, and having to, you know, play against Mark Lyons and that team. It's, it's a sense uh, where I think it's, it's sort of like a family. Um, I look at it as a family approach. Uh, Mark has been good to me. Um, you know, far as I'm, I'm a young head coach, only five years in. This is my fifth year. Um, a lot I learned, I learned through Mark when I was there the three years prior to me um, starting at Alcoba. So I'm, you know, I, I'm very respectful and gracious um, to, to Mark Lyons and not just Mark, the whole staff and, and the, the administration. That, um, the athletic director called me today and wished me luck. Um, so it's sort of like a, a family um, 
uh, relationship um, because of uh, the time I spent here. And my kids went there. I live in the uh, center. So um, it's a thing where, you know, you know I, I know the people, they know me. So it, it's a mutual respect there. But um, like any family, like any brothers, I want to be him. <laughs> so, doggone right, he want to beat me. So um, in between the lines from four, first to fourth quarter, we're going to be competing. We're going to be competing hard. And, uh, but after that, you know, it, that respect comes immediately right back. Yeah, that's, that's great. And it's really cool that, you know, you guys have kind of built a really strong rivalry between the two schools in the last, you know, five to 10 years that Central Valley kind of just came to be, um, you know, 12 years ago. And, and now already we've got a, a really strong rivalry between the two schools. I think it's like six and a half miles separate them. Um, yes. And, you know, you've, you've met in high stakes situations before and may do it twice this year with the conference title on the line this week and potentially for the Whitfield title in a few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's good for the community. I, I think both communities. I mean, we share the same zip code. Um, so um, at times in certain areas. So, um, you know, we know them, they know us. Um, a lot of people from Aliquippa live in center and uh, a lot of center people um, live in. So there's a strong familiarity between the communities, between the people, um, between the, the, the high school um, students. I know some of the, the players that played um, with some of the Central Valley players growing up um, in youth football. So um, we know each other. They know us. We know them. Um, we know they're coming hard, and we're definitely going to be coming hard. So um, it's going to be exciting. I'm excited to see how our kids compete. So um, I'm looking forward to it on Friday. Yeah, and you talked about, you know, uh, really competing. And obviously, you, just like with any family, you, you know, you want to go out there and, uh, you know, uh, kind of, make sure that you beat your brother <laughs> or what have you, but talk a little bit about some of the players that you're going to be relying on to, to make that happen. I, I think, uh, you know, being, you know, it's, it's well known being, a, being a small uh, single way school um, when you play one A, and this is no disrespect for the lower classes. Uh, when you play one A, two A and a little bit of three A at times, um, you could basically win based off your talent as uh, far as your skill players. Um, but when you get up there into the, uh, some of the three and definitely the four, five, and six, you got to have it up front. Um, so I'm going to be relying on our guys up front um, to make sure they're taking care of their business up front. Um, that, that's where it all starts, and that's where it all ends um, when, you, when you're playing at this level. And that I'm great. I'm so glad you mentioned that because, you know, one of the things we like to do on this show is to highlight the players who you don't always see on the stat sheet, right? The, the offensive and defensive line guys. And, you know, I know your team's kind of taking up that trench dogs moniker. So you want to just give a shout out to the guys up front by name so that we can get their names out there. Cause it's easy to find rushing stats and passing stats, but it's hard to find offensive line stats. So we like to get those guys names out there too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our left tackle has been there uh, three years now. Um, that's Naquan Crowder. Uh, number 70, Jason McBride started a little bit as a freshman. Um, uh, he's our left guard. Our center, Braden Wilcox, started all uh, 14 games last year and started all the games this year. Um, our right guard is uh, Nico Eberhardt, number 52. He started as a, since a freshman, um, so he's been there. And Kamari Matthews, um, this is his first year here. Um, he's missed the first four games because of the rules, um, so he, he's, he's coming into his own now. Um, so, you know, we, we have a good group up front. They're starting to mesh and gel together. Um, so I, I'm excited for those guys. And, you know, our tight end is Jez Williams um, and also um, Cameron Lindsay at times. Um, so so they're, they're playing well right now, and um, they have to play well Friday, um, you know, for us to be successful. You know, you talked a little bit about how maybe getting into a little bit rougher weather um, can dictate maybe your offense uh, change as well, getting into maybe having to run the football versus pass. Is there anything else that you kind of change up or change a little philosophical um, adjustments as you go into the postseason from a regular season mode? Uh, I think I lost you. Oh. oh, still there? Oh, darn. Oh, um, my. That's okay. Maybe he'll come back in. Think yeah, hopefully he can uh, get back but, in there. Yeah, I I had two more questions to ask him, so I hope he comes back because yeah, I, um, I think he'll be yeah. back. Yes, we had um, the same thing happened a little earlier. I know that we did a at a coach interview, and unfortunately, here I'm gonna see if I can uh, 
Yeah, okay. There he is. There we okay. go. I apologize. I lost you for a second there. That's no all right. worries. So um, any any change in postseason philosophies beyond, you know, the offensive stuff that you, you, you know, reiterated? Um, it's, it's, it's a process. I, I think um, as the season goes, you might do things earlier in the year to test and see what you have, try to get some young guys in there to try to build death. Um, but as the season go along, you, you, you throw out the trash and, and you keep the, keep the <laughs> uh, so um, I think we're at that point where we're starting to throw the trash out and really rely on, you know, what we do best. Um, so, the, you know, Coach Short, who's been here for 40 years, our defensive coordinator, always says those last six weeks that you got to be hitting it full, full stride. So um, we're starting to get there. I think the kids are starting to listen more. Um, it was one thing I talked to the kids about because, you know, you know I, I can't hide it from these guys because they've been with me um, for all their four years. I mean, they've been to the Whippeo Championship every year. We lost their freshman and sophomore year. We won last year. Um, so I, I give them, you know, a little bit more leeway than I have in the past just because of the experience that they have. Um, but it's a sense of um, you got to really be focused. And I, I don't want to have to lose a game this year for you to start paying attention. Um, so um, they're maturing <laughs> and that. And, um, you know, I, I'm relying on them um, that experience um, to, to take over at this point in the season. So, uh, bigger picture, one of the things I was really excited to see coming into this season was that the new field project got approved and is moving forward. Um, yes. You know, for those out there watching the show that may not know, Aliquippa Stadium um, was in dire need of, of an upgrade, um, and the, the new project is absolutely beautiful. It's fantastic. So, Coach, can you talk a little bit about what the, the new field is going to mean for the program and for the community? Absolutely. I mean, when my first year, it was it's, it was dilapidated. It, it was pretty bad shape. And I was just at times just wanted um, just the visitor side that was up at one, that point just to be painted, just so it looked presentable. Um, but, you know, fortunately, the school board agreed to it. Um, I give all the credit to the school board and to Dr. Kyes Woods, who came in as superintendent last year, also our Cooper guy, um, all the credit with, with uh, making it happen. Um, so we, we're going to get um, new turf. Um, we're going to get a new home stands, a uh, new scoreboard and new lights. Um, there's some other things that's in the works that I can't speak on now, but you know, I'm knocking on wood and it's going to be very, very exciting. So, um, there's some one, one project that we're trying to put together that, you know, hopefully we could get it done and everything be done at once, but it'd be so great, uh, for the kids, um, to get them something and a place to be, you know, in the summertime after school. And it'll be sort of our YMCA. There's not much for our kids to do after school or in the summer. Uh, we have no swimming pools, uh, very few playgrounds uh, for the kids to be other than, you know, walking the streets and on the corners. Well, Coach, if, um, you know, there's ever any fundraising campaigns or GoFundMe links or anything that you'd like us to promote, we're certainly happy to do that. So feel free to send them our way. Um, <laughs> one last question for you. Um, so, Obviously, we started off by you know talking about the state championships that you've won, um, which is an incredible accomplishment on the field. But what's your proudest accomplishment off the field, other than the, the all the winning that you've done? I think it's starting to take shape. Um, you know, like I said, my my biggest concern coming in was not to win games. I mean, you know, winning games and winning championship that comes and goes year by year. But um, how do you shape and mold a kid for? 30, 40 years, the rest of his life, then his kids, then his grandkids. Um, that was my main concern. Um, so we're getting better academically. Um, I know we started, uh, Dr. Woods and the uh, school board agreed to start a, a mandatory um, grade point average to be able to play week to week. And it's based on your core uh, courses. You have to have a 2.0 um, to play um, each week. And we get a list every Monday. And then if you don't have a 3.0, um, you have to go to study table um, twice a week. Um, so uh, fortunately, believe it or not, it's like we have maybe 35 kids on the team. And right now we only have six that's in study table. So wow. that, like, that's awesome. Kids are getting um, doing it right in the classroom. That's that that's the most important field you're going to play on in the classroom. And, you know, a lot of times, a lot of um, things are written about our success on the field, but um, you look at Tyquay Hayes, he has a 4.0. Cameron Lindsay has a 3.6. Brandon Banks has a 4.0. DJ Walker has a 3.8. Nate Lindsay has a 3.8. Jason McBride, 3.5. So these kids are getting those offers, but they're also getting those offers because they had a GPA. 
Um, so um, I think it's my job now is to not have this, allow this to be just a, a one, two year thing. Uh, uh, my job is to maintain it. Um, another exciting thing that I was happy about was that I hired our first female coach this year through, with the blessing of the school board. And she's, going, she's our academic coach, our academic advisor. Um, when I was traveling with my son, he plays at Liberty Basketball and he would introduce me to his academic advisor who would travel. I said, well, why can't we have that at Copa? So the school board agreed to have, um, to, to have a paid coach to be our academic coach to maintain wow. their grades throughout the year. So, so that's something I'm real you know, happy about. That's awesome. That's yeah, so that, cool to hear. That is so totally awesome. Coach, listen, uh, thank you for taking some time out of obviously a very busy week to spend some time with Ian and myself. I know that uh, we're quite honored to have you, but uh, you know what? Uh, it's that time of year. It's Aliquippa time of year, the postseason. Everybody knows you guys for postseason success, so we wish you all the best and a good luck this postseason and in your game this week, okay? Hey, I sincerely appreciate it, Bruce and Ian. Thank you, and it's, it's a pleasure to meet you both, so I really appreciate it. All right, thanks a lot, Coach. You can just exit out there. Take care. Yes, Thanks, sir. Coach. We appreciate it. See you. Yeah. You know, the, the most impressive thing about it, the statistics that he was talking about for his players were their grade point averages. Not that he's thrown for 1,100 yards or he's rushed for, you know, uh, 1,000 or whatever like that. He's reciting the grade point averages of all of his starters. That's it can sh- amazing. I mean, that just, to me, it was to- I was just totally floored, but that just shows you you know, um, the uh, the emphasis uh, that the Aliquippa team and the school board has in, in the right places. Yeah, they're successful on the field, but boy, off the field uh, in a, a dedicated, uh, you know, academics coach and grade point averages that he can just recite, you know, like their rushing average or whatever. It's pretty incredible. It is. And and I think it speaks to the family atmosphere that he talks about building with the program, right? That, you know, that's the things you know about your own kids. Like, you you know, you know what your kids are doing in school that, you know, he is the head coach, um, you know, has built that family atmosphere and that family culture um, that they are, you know, all looking out for each other in all aspects of life, not just, you know, on the football field, that it, it permeates their whole life um and you know aliquippa is just an, an amazing story continually right i mean it's you know a, an, an old steel town where the mills left the jobs dried up and just over time like their continued success on the football field in spite of all the adversity that they have um you know off the field is just an incredible story and what they've been able to produce over time um you know just the the continual talent that's come through there and and come out of that town um, is, is just amazing. And from a football standpoint, it speaks to, you know, the, the quality of, you know, he talked about the consistency of coaching with the assistant coaches and the youth program and what they do to um, build up and develop these kids from a, a young age um, into talented players so that by the time they hit high school and then even when they move on to college and, um, you know, onto the NFL, because a lot of Aliquippa players have gone on to the NFL, um, you know, that, that they've got that good, solid foundation for success because they've been building it for so long. Um, and it's, it's awesome to hear about them getting a new stadium for the community. Um, I was so excited when I saw that that was happening because um, he, you know, he mentioned the, the visitor stands. Um, they actually got condemned a few years ago because they were in such disrepair. So all the fans had to sit on the home side of the field. And it was just one of those things where, um, you know, they, they worked for a long time. I know to, to fundraise the money and get grants and everything else to, um, you know, finally put in a, a new stadium that can, um, you know, I'll, I'll say match the prestige of their program, right? A, a program with Aliquippa's prestige deserves a, a stadium that is a, a jewel of the community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, coach talked about the fact that uh, it's not only like the football stadium, but the whole kind of hub of the community, because he said they don't have a lot of parks and, you know, not a lot of playgrounds and everything else. So utilizing it as like the center point of the community that we already know that it is, is just fantastic. So, you know, hopefully we'll have another guest coming on here in a couple of minutes. We still have some time. So why don't you take control and yeah. let's do some talking here? Yeah. So we are, it is 
Aliquip Essential Valley Week. Um, you know, this is kind of what the whole season has been building towards. You know, we've been talking about how these are the best two teams, not only in the in 4A, but in the WPIAL altogether and playing in the same conference, now playing for the conference title this week. So we're doing a heavy preview of the Aliquippa Central Valley game here. Um, we're hoping to have Mark Lyons on shortly as well so we can get both perspectives from both coaches. Um, a little rundown on the Aliquippa program. Um, been around since 1910. Um, they were Woodlawn High School before Aliquippa, um, but their all-time record, they have the uh, second most wins of any team in Whippeal history. Um, Jeanette is number one. Jeanette's only five wins ahead of Aliquippa. So theoretically, if Aliquippa like goes on a run to the state championship game this year, they could become the winningest program in Whippeal history. Um, you know, and, and everything else is pretty much all time Whippeal best. You know, 27 consecutive playoff appearances, 14 straight Whippeal finals. 44 playoff appearances overall, 18 time Whitfield champions, four time state champions. Like, you know, just you run down the list and it's just incredible what this, what this town and this program has been able to accomplish. And considering, you know, like coach said, they're a one, a size school that's being forced to play up in four a because the PIA is stupid and how they interpret their rules. Um, that's my commentary, but it's also fact, um, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, you know, they've, they've, they've continually played up, right. That, that even in the four classification era, they were a one, a single a size school that played up in double a. And then when we went to six classes, they played up in, in three a and now four a um, that, that what they've been able to do over time is, is outstanding and, and incredible. Um, on the other side is central Valley um, who was formed in 2010 uh, by the merger of center and Manaka school districts. Um, they've only missed the playoffs once since that merger, which is also pretty incredible. Three-time defending Whippeal 3A champs, two-time defending PIAA 3A champs, um, moved up to 4A this year, uh, five-time Whippeal champions. So five times in 11 years of being a school, Central Valley's won the Whippeal title, back-to-back um, -back state champions. Um, Manaka, who preceded Central Valley, also won three Whippeal championships, um, you know, and, and just looking at these two programs, you know, side by side, right. I mentioned Mark's six here. So let's part, uh, six combined state titles, 26 combined Whippeal titles. So we will now talk with coach Lyons and then get into the game some more. And it looks like he's just about ready to, end of the building here and there he is Hi guys. Coach Lyons, thanks so much for joining us tonight on uh the week of aliquippa central valley the parkway conference championship showdown here in week nine which very well may be a prelude to the whippeal championship game as well so we really appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight thank you for having me yeah <laughs> I tell you, Coach, uh, it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, you know, we uh, were just talking a little bit uh, about, you know, expectations and what have you. And, you know, expectations for Central Valley, you know, coming in as, you know, a two-time defending state champion in one class. Now you're in another class. I mean, talk about the expectations of, you know, moving into a different classification are they obviously the same and attainable as when you were in 3A? Yeah, um, to be quite honest with you, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of the comments, concerns, um, the questions. You know, you guys are moving up in class and um, what's going to change? Uh, what's the challenges? And obviously there's always challenges when you face uh, new teams. But for our guys, you know, their expectations don't change. And we keep them... Uh, we keep the expectations obtainable and that's daily um, us getting better. And then obviously if we do those, we think the end results will find its way to, to where we want to be. And yeah, yeah. coach, you've, you've certainly seen success on the field so far this season. Um, you know, I think you have the highest scoring team in 4A, um, one of the top defenses in 4A, uh, but 
as we talk about a lot on this show, that all starts up front with the offensive and defensive lines. And, you know, it's really easy to go out and find stats on, you know, passing yards and rushing yards, but we like to sh give shout outs to the guys up front too, that don't get their names out there that much. So um, you want to give a shout out to your guys down in the trenches? Yeah, absolutely. And um, um, great, great segment there giving those guys a shout out, but they do, cause they do go unnoticed. And um you know, we had this discussion in our staff room probably a month ago, and I, I think we're further along from an offensive line standpoint that we thought we would be at this point. Um, they've they've really seemed to gel quicker than we thought. Um, you know, we did have three guys return from a, as starters, but you know, when you plug new guys in, or you just you just are not sure how that will mesh and and how they will respond with one another but um all off season you know we we saw we saw you know a little glimpse of you know these these guys have a chance to be pretty good you know if they continue to do what they did um they spent a lot of time together not only on the practice field but off the field which is a, which is a great sign when you're trying to become a unit you know working as one and these guys have so um, I think there, there's not a man on our football team that, that would not agree with your comment. And obviously seeing the work that they've put in, that, that leads to our success. Yeah, coach. And, you know, as you wind the regular season down and now start to prepare for postseason football, is there any philosophical change that you go through in uh, preparing your team or in, you know, offensive or defensive philosophy? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, first, we always talk about that when we start to start to see the color change in the leaves and, and the leaves start to become bare with them falling, we want to make sure we are at our peak. And we try to monitor the progress. And, and when I say that is the fact that we don't try to overload everybody in August and September. You know, we try to gradually fit guys into their role. We're always looking every day at practice from another, from somewhere else or from another group, from another player who can potentially help us come October and November. We put a great deal of stock in our, on our JV games. We put a great deal of stock in the way guys practice. So we, can find another guy. Um, so, you know, we get late in October and heading into November, we feel that our guys are still fresh, not only mentally, but physically. And we have more guys involved than when we started back in August. Wow, that's a very interesting. Ian, you have another question for Coach? I do, yeah. So it is Aliquippa week. So, um, you know, with the schools being basically neighbors sharing a zip code six and a half miles apart, um, you know, with a really strong budding rivalry here over the last, you know, six years or so since we moved to the sixth classification era, I think this will be the seventh meeting between the schools. So how do you prepare for an opponent like Aliquippa that you're so familiar with? You know, Coach Warfield was one of your assistants before he went to Aliquippa. Um, you know, it's it's almost like brothers fighting each other. You know, you, you know each other like the back of your hand. That's a great point. Um, first of all, let me just say this. There's there's no motivation needed. Um, there's no raw, raw speech. There's no uh, message that needs to be sent. There's no, there's no quote that needs to be posted, no T-shirt that needs to be made, especially for Aliquippa. Those things take care of themselves because of the fact that it's Aliquippa. Um, what you want to do, obviously, this week is making sure you're, you're, you're hitting all the finer points of your game. Um, and believe it or not, you, you want to scale it to a point where you just try to keep it as, as fundamental as you can, because come Thursday, come Friday, I know all day in school, these guys have heard so much about this upcoming game since back in last spring, when they revealed the schedule that they'll be ready. Um, you don't want to make sure you, you just want to make sure they're not overhyped for the game where they kind of lose the little, the little things that got them here. And, um, that, you know, that's our job as coaches, but it really is a neat week to, to take part in because as I said earlier, you know, it's, it's just basically coaching your guys into getting in the right spot. You don't have to pull any kind of 
little secret gadgets or, or, or any fundamental or um, any, any motivational things to get them ready. Yeah. And, you know, along with obviously the fact that it's your big rival, you know, mm -hmm. you've got, I believe uh, five Whippeal titles, consecutive state championships. Um, you know, what keeps you motivated uh, as well, coach? I mean, in, uh, you know, is it the kids? Is it the community? Is it the game? What is really, you know, lighting your fire each and every day when you go to practice? That's an awesome question. Um, you know, I, I think just just myself and the staff that I've put together, um, you know, we don't spend a lot of time reflecting. We'll do that someday when we're all I, I guess we're getting closer than I'd, I'd like to admit sometimes <laughs> uh, when we get closer to the fact that we've been in this long enough, it's time for us to step aside and give and allow someone else to kind of control the ship. We'll have plenty of time to do that. Um, I, I think we're, we're always in the moment of, you know, let's, let's keep our head down. Um, a lot of the guys on the staff are kind of, we're cut from the same cloth. Um, We've always worked hard, not only just in the game of football, but um, each and every one of us have worked hard in our own personal lives and our job. Um, they don't mind that the grind of it, um, but they also have a balance. And I think that's important. Um, we go at it pretty hard, um, but I think a lot of people would be surprised as we, we do kind of step away. Um, that's one thing I've learned after 30 some years in this game that, you know, once the season's over, everybody, well, Sue's Christmas is over. Let's get back at it. We really do take some time off. The um, last four or five years, you know, <clears throat> we probably, when we give our guys off after the season, we really don't even see them much until late February. I mean, we do give them that time away, and we don't ask a lot of them. We'll do a little bit of in, in May. We'll also give them the whole month of June off. But we know once I, I think our key date for us where we kind of just, all right, let's lock in, let's put those blinders on. And that's just, you know, everything's kind of just focused on on the kids at Central Valley is after the 4th of July is really when we when we crank it up. Wow. Very, very interesting. Ian, you got some another question for coach? Sure. Um, so, you know looking forward bigger picture as well um you know the the winner of this game i'll say will likely get the top seed in the 4a playoffs and will probably avoid a, a very good mckeesport team in the semifinals. um you know so uh, i mean obviously it's it's out quick but it's a rivalry game you want to win but you know how much how much stock and importance do you put on getting this win when you know you'll probably have to face them again later down the line as well you know, you probably, it sounds like you were sitting in, in our staff room. Um, <laughs> a couple of days ago. We had this kind of discussion, um, you know, just in light of what we said earlier, you know, it's an exciting week. Our guys are going to be, are stoked. I mean, they're, they're going to be ready to go come Friday. I know Ella Quipa will, I know Mike staff will, um, but you know, there's always a balance. We always talk about this thing of being a marathon, we're still in the midst of the marathon right now. You know, this is the sprint when we don't see the finish line yet. Some people may view this game, um, you know, with different set of lens than we do. Um, sure. We want to win. We know that, but more important, we owe it to ourselves. Our guys hold each other accountable. We want to make sure we're playing good football. And no matter the outcome, as long as we can look each other in the eye and said, we prepared well all week, we played hard for one another, and whatever happens on a scoreboard happens. Um, we didn't shortchange the game, and we didn't shortchange our, each other. So that's kind of been our mindset in, in years past when we get in these big situations. And I, and I, I think the telltale sign of that is, when you have a big game late in the season, it's how you respond the following week. Um, it says a lot about first your, your senior leadership, and then it says a lot about your mindset of your football team. If each and every week you're able to finish the game, recover, shower, clean yourself up, 
get ready for the next opponent and making sure you're always taking monumental steps upwards. Yeah, that, that's uh, great stuff. Great stuff. I'll tell you what, Coach. Um, it sure sounds like you're ready for the game. <laughs> but uh, listen, Absolutely. thanks for, for taking a bit of time. Um, I want to thank you personally for, you know, obviously uh, when we see each other and that, we always say hi and always appreciate, Absolutely. you know, your support for, uh, for, you know, Ian, myself, and, you know, all of the things that I've been doing there. And uh, I tell you what, I can't wait to uh, not only uh, see this game, but see the subsequent games that you're going to be playing in the postseason. And, you know, uh, fingers crossed, hey, you know, I'll run across you on the field there uh, sure. at Cumberland Valley this year rather than Hershey. But uh, well, I always like to see you in that setting. I can tell you that much. And <laughs> listen, I enjoy what you guys do for high school sports, especially high school football. And, you know, great shout out to your backdrop there, man. Very festive. Oh uh, yeah, well yeah, I'm out on the deck. Uh, and you know, I get I've actually had some really nice comments about that. We've actually have some guy who likes the fact that I kind of change it up each week. But uh, yeah, I'm out on the deck. I mean, uh, right. rather than uh, a, a little uh, unique uh, backdrop there. But, I tell you what, that kind of backdrop, you probably get a lot of kids here in a week or so trick or treat. Is that, is that <laughs> accurate? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a little. Uh, hopefully, they're not on my back deck, but hopefully, they'll stay <laughs> out front. But anyway, listen, coach, thank you very thanks. much. Thanks thank for taking guys. some time out of a busy week and best of luck. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank yeah, just go ahead and you, exit coach. out then. All right. Thanks. Take care. Yep. All right. There okay. we go. This is so cool. I mean, it's so awesome. Anytime <laughs> we're able to get like both coaches from the same game on, on the same show, like having both coach Warfield and coach Lyons on the show is just incredible. And, you know, I, I think the, the relationship they have with each other with coach Warfield being a former assistant of coach Lyons, um, you know, yes, it adds to the rivalry, but you know, th there's also that, that familial aspect between them that like, they know, in any week they're not playing each other that like they can always go to each other for help too, you know, if they ever need anything. Yeah. Especially being right next door to each other. It's, it's really cool. Um, you know, and, and just seeing the, the approach that both teams have to the game. And, and I think, and that was kind of why I asked the question about the playoffs too, because, you know, looking forward, McKeesport's been really good this year. And, you know, if, if you can get a path to the Whitfield championship game without having to go through McKeesport, um, you know, I don't want to say it's guaranteed because Armstrong's a good team. Highlands is a good team. There's other good teams out there, but I mean, Aliquippa and Central Valley have pretty much been mercy ruling almost everyone this season, especially coming down the stretch here. So, um, you know, there, there's really you want the three... easiest road that you can get, right? You right. want there's... the easiest road you can get. They're yeah. all good teams, but you know, clearly, yeah, you, you want the easiest road you get. And, and yeah. boy, I tell you what, uh, coach Lyons, he's dialed in. I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. You could he tell is, he's, he's absolutely he's, locked in. Like It's Monday night when we're recording this and he's ready to play this game tomorrow. Like, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but you know, coach Lyons, I'll tell you what, um, you know, he, he, uh, he made that point. He, he said it to me a number of times, you know, <laughs> we're out on the field there at Hershey park stadium or whatever like that. You know, he's always said, Hey, I'm, it's good to see you because I know I'm, you know, in the championship game. And uh, we spent some good time at the big 33, um, this last year with Mark and Bob Palco. And uh, I can't thank all of these coaches uh, for, you know, just giving us the time of day. I mean, you know, we're first and foremost, we're fans of this, um, you know, game and of the Whippeal and of high school football here in Pennsylvania. And to have a gentleman like uh, coach Lyons, uh, you know, uh, give us some time. Hey, um, it's, it's much appreciated. Absolutely. And, and yeah, it's, it was, I'm, I'm just like starstruck that we had both these coaches on today. This is me too. so cool to me. Like uh, it, it uh, really is uh, yeah. as I can tell. All right. Well, all right, back to it. So, you know, in the midst of this, this <laughs> showdown for the Parkway conference title between these two schools, which have six combined state titles, 26 combined whip titles, six and a half miles apart. Um, you know, central Valley does lead the all-time series four to two. Um, Interesting note, which I did not want to bring up with either coach because it might be a sore spot, but uh, Coach Warfield took over 
uh, at Aliquippa in 2018. So he's actually never beaten Coach Lyons. Um, Coach Lyons is 4-0 uh, against his protege so far. Um, that may change this year, but, uh, you know, so far Central Valley has had the best of it since uh, Coach Warfield took over. Um, granted, you know, in the years they were in different classifications, that didn't stop uh, Aliquippa from winning state titles. Actually, you know, Aliquippa won the state title in 2018 when they were in a conference together um, and last year when they were in separate classifications. Um, oh, the Whitfield uh, Championship game in 2019 um, was actually 6-6 six to six in regulation, went to overtime. Um, Aliquippa got, or no, Central Valley got the ball first, scored a touchdown, kicked the extra point. Aliquippa got the ball second, scored a touchdown, went for two, and Central Valley got a stop to win win the championship, which was just an incredible end to a Whitfield title game. Uh, you know, you talked about the fact of, uh, you know, obviously that they're going to be, you know, playing down the road or whatever like that. But the, the benefit of them playing really, um, you know, toward the end of the, or obviously the last game of the regular season, it 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 eliminates that game shock that both teams might have from playing tougher opponents, you know, or getting back into the swing of playing tougher opponents because, yeah, they've had, you know, pretty much cakewalks over the last, you know, couple of weeks. So this yeah. is, wow, this is uh, a slap to the face of this is what you're going to have to uh, face if you, uh, you know, move on and not only the Whippeal but the state championship. So I think it's a great test at the perfect time, uh, but I think everybody knows full well at uh these two are most likely going to be playing at Heinz Field for the 4A Whippeal title. I yeah, I would say, you know, one of these two plus maybe I mean McKeesport's also really good. I mean, th they are the three best teams. I would argue the three best teams in the state. Um but, you know, we'll we'll see where it goes. Um as a historical comparison, you know, I mentioned Central Valley's 4 and 2 against Aliquippa since 2010 when Central Valley was formed. Um, there were a few games that Aliquippa played against the precursor schools. Um, Aliquippa really dominated Manaka back in the 1920s and 30s. And then Aliquippa really dominated center, um, you know, for three decades between 1980 and 2009, um, including two playoff victories. Um, but just looking at these two teams side by side, you know, Central Valley, since they were formed in 2010, has the best winning percentage in Whippeal history. Aliquippa has the second most wins of any school in Whippeal history. Um, you know, Aliquippa has the most playoff wins of any school. Central Valley is the three-time defending Whippeal 3A champions. Aliquippa has made it to Heinz Field in 14 straight years. Um, you know, just 26 Whippeal championships, uh, six state titles between them. Just, um, you know, the the prestige between these two programs is just absolutely incredible from a historical standpoint. Um, and looking at this season, you know, they play in the same conference. So they've played all the same opponents and they've pretty much, like I said, mercy ruled <laughs> Isn't pretty that, much everybody. I know that is, uh, that is very interesting when you do that compare side by side comparison. Uh, obviously the big difference there was, you know, the Central Valley kind of pummeling West Allegheny where it was a tight game with Aliquippa, but. Yeah, well, and I think some of that was, you know, Aliquippa got West Allegheny early in the year. Um, and Coach Warfield talked about how there was some some guys that weren't playing for them. They were still working in some new starters, trying out some new things early in the year. And Central Valley got West Allegheny last week, later in the year when, as Coach Lyons talked about, you know, you kind of round into form. You bring some new guys in that, you know, maybe weren't playing for you early in the year because you didn't really know what they have. But then you, you know, start to discover, oh, hey, we've got something with these guys. So, um, you know, I, I think that may be more just a factor of time or, or you know, date when they played rather than um, respective quality of uh you know, the, Team, the teams. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, you know, just looking at their overall numbers, Central Valley's first in 4A in scoring, Aliquippa's second. Um, Aliquippa's second in overall defense, Central Valley's third. Um, you know, and McKeesport's the, the other one that's kind of in the, the top three in those rankings. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the current winning streak because Central Valley just moved up in classification and won two straight state titles. They've won 36 straight games, which is the longest streak in the state. Aliquip has won 20 straight games, which is the second longest streak in the state. Um, you know, now that Southern Columbia has lost some games this year. Um, the conference winning streak, Central Valley has won 27 straight conference games. Aliquip has won 16 straight conference games. So, you know, just the 
Something's got to give. Something's got to give. And this is a, a <laughs> colossal clash of Titans here, um, you know, in this, this week nine game, um, you know, and, and even just looking down the statistics of it, like, you know, Alec Quippa's quarterback, Antoine Johnson, thrown for like almost a thousand yards and you know, 12 touchdowns. And Quentin Good, the quarterback for Alec Quippa, is thrown for like 1,300 yards and 13 touchdowns. And Taquai Hayes for Alec Quippa, the running back, and Brett Fitzsimmons for Central Valley. They both have outstanding safeties with Donovan Walker for Alec Quippa and Javen Thompson for Central Valley. And it's just like you could go on and on and just naming these players and like, you look at this game on paper and you're like, these teams are so evenly matched. I have no idea, you know, how, how it's going to play out. And that's why they play the game on the field and we're going to find out and it's going to be awesome. Yep. Okay. So thank you everyone wow, for joining w- us. What? This is the WPAO Blitz show. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you everyone <laughs> for joining us for the Whippeal Blitz show. Um, if you're watching, you know where to find us on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram and obviously on YouTube because uh, that's where our show is and all of our articles on SteelCityBlitz.com. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Sports Solutions Marketing, Brood Athletic, uh, and Steel City Blitz for hosting us. Um, you know, it's it's been great all season. Um, you know, to go through this journey of the Whippeal season, we're wrapping up here in the final week of the regular season. We'll continue on through the playoffs and. You know, this is it's it's just so cool. Um, you know, everyone we've been able to we talk have, to and everything this we year. We have so much fun uh, you know, doing this and you know, it was funny because before um uh, coach Warfield came on, I said, uh, you know, I started this we started this show a few years ago just because I wanted to learn more about the, you know, the Whippeal and try and get it out there so that the rest of the state that they're, you know, that would could take a look behind the curtain too. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of behind the curtain, you know, we're t- we've <laughs> talked a lot about looking forward to week nine, but let's talk about some things that happened in week eight. Wow. Armstrong got a massive win over Highlands and arguably the biggest win of the week to clinch the greater Allegheny conference title. Uh, Keystone Oaks, a win over Washington to clinch a playoff spot for the golden Eagles in the two a century conference, Maple town with a hard fought win over Manesson. Um, I actually went down for that game to Southeastern green County to see Maple town, really cool little stadium kind of tucked in like this, this nook between the mountains down there. And the it's, it was awesome. Um, and then Bishop Canavan really put a thumping on Olsh. Um, Olsh, unfortunately, lost their quarterback, Nehemiah Azim, to a oh. knee injury in pregame warmups. So they kind of, you know, 15 minutes before the game had to figure out who was going to play quarterback for them. Um, so, you know, Olsh's uh, playoff hopes are actually now a little bit on the ropes. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, some really good games, Central Catholic beating Seneca Valley, Hampton beating Mars. Um, the big upset of the week, though, Apollo Ridge in overtime beating Sarah Catholic. That was an absolute stunner. Um, and then Mohawk beating Western Beaver on Saturday afternoon. Um, bit of a surprise as well. Uh, some other noteworthy results. Bethel Park wrapped up a playoff spot with their win over South Fayette. Pine Richland put themselves in position uh, to make the playoffs with a win this week. And then Hempfield, which had such a good start to the season, lost the plum. Um, which had some playoff implications, basically yeah. knocked Hempfield out of playoff contention in 5A because only eight teams are going to make the playoffs in 5A. Um, you know, it's uh, it was it tough ending to the season, but Plum was a really good team that battled all year too. Um, so our streak watch, the only the only difference uh, is that Highlands lost to Armstrong, which was their first loss of the season. Central Valley and Aliquippa still the only teams carrying over winning streaks from previous seasons. Um, everyone else there on the list uh, are ones that, uh, you know, are just winning streaks from this year. On the losing streak side, not much change there. Um, so we will uh, continue to move those on as we look forward. Brownsville lost again, playing as an independent on the conference streak side. Nothing has changed there since last week. Um, you know, Central Valley, Elizabeth forward, Aliquippa still rolling on forward. Although I should note here on the conference winning streak side that Aliquippa and Central Valley play this week. So that's number one against number three. And Elizabeth forward plays against Bell Vernon this week. So that's number two against number six. So um, two of those conference streaks are going to come to an end uh, this week. Interesting. Yes. Our brute athletic player of the week. I mentioned that massive upset that Apollo Ridge had yeah, over Sarah wow. Catholic. Nick Kersey, the running back, 338 yards and five touchdowns, including the game winner in overtime. Um, just an all around great performance there for Nick, um, 
just running over around and through a very good Sarah Catholic defense. Yeah. Yeah, that that's the thing is, is he did that against a really good team. Okay, some of our other top performers, Caden Olson, who was our player of the week last week, almost got it again this week for his sixth touchdown performance that's in their win just, over Highlands. You know, four hundred and thirty yards and five passing touchdowns. He's just nuts. I mean, yeah. you know, you're gonna have to eventually. You're gonna have to come up with a player of the year too. So uh, uh, I, I'm, you yes, know, I'm sure yeah. you're. I'm sure you're putting that into the in some spreadsheet somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I I am. Uh, you know that. That being said, uh, playoff performance matters a lot in those yeah, player of the year conversations sure. as well. So we will do our players of the year, um, you know, in our, our final season wrap up episode. But um, yeah, yeah we, we are keeping tabs on these things as well. Um, Joey Mayer from Hampton, keeping the Talbots in uh, playoff contention with that seven point win over Mars. He put up five total touchdowns. Johnny Huff from Nishanik with five total touchdowns. Ben Lane from Freeport and Dom Danino from Kiski also in the five touchdown club this week. So really great performances all around for all of those guys. The other one that bears mentioning last week, we mentioned the 1000, 1000 club that there were a number of, play of players closing in on Matt Sieg freshman quarterback uh, from Fort Cherry became the first freshman to join the 1000, 1000 club uh, in Whippeo history. Um, a couple weeks ago, or actually last week, uh, he surpassed the 1000 yard rushing mark. And then this past week, he surpassed the thousand yard passing mark. So really cool accomplishment. Incredible. For Matt. And is just a freshman, you know, the sky's the limit for this kid. I can't wait to see where, where he goes over the next few years. Yeah. Brad um, Birch did it as a freshman, but only passing, not running. Right, right. Not, not running. Um, and so uh, Matt Sieg became the 14th player in Whippeal history to accomplish the 1,000, 1,000 feet. Um, so congratulations to him. Um, we've got some other contenders here heading into the final week of the regular season. I will note this is just a regular season number, um, and, and that is so that it's an apples to apples comparison, because obviously if some team went on a run to the state title, you have almost another whole season, right? You know, you go from nine games to 16 games um, where, you know, to, to rack up statistics. So um, Johnny Huff from Nishanik, who I just mentioned is, you know, within 80 passing yards of joining the club, Cody Rubrecht from Greensburg, Salem, um, within 80 passing and 80 rushing yards. Um, and then Roman Sarnik from Franklin Regional also, um, you know, I, I'll say is, is in the ballpark. Um, Conlon Green, Jake Lehew, um, they're going to need a whole lot of rushing yards this week to be able to get there. But a couple other guys with some strong potential. Um, and I know from talking to some folks on Twitter, this is something that's kind of on the radar for these programs. Um, and, and Greensburg Salem's eliminated from a playoff spot. They're playing against the depleted South Allegheny team this week. So I got to think they're going to do everything they can to get Cody over the hump. Um, actually Franklin regional plays against Penn Trafford this week. So you've wow. got two, two players on the list that could be competing yes, for this. Correct. Yeah. I well. saw that. I mean, that's yep. a great matchup. Yes. All right. So let's talk about some of our playoff clinchings across the board. Um, 10 of the 17 conferences have had the champions clinch. Um, and the, and there are 54 of the 67 playoff spots have been clinched up till this point as well. So still, uh, seven conference champions and 13 playoff spots still to be awarded uh, in this final week of the season. So a lot still to be decided along with just, you know, ordering within the standings as well. Um, just as a reminder of how the playoff qualifiers work, um, you know, the, the big one here, most conferences will qualify either four or five teams. The big difference is in 5A, where only eight playoff teams uh, qualify. So that's just the top two from each conference, along with two third place wild cards. So just as a reminder of how the Whitfield standings work, it goes by conference record first, followed by head to head results. If conference record is tied, followed by Gardner points in conference games only, which is a strength of victory metric, followed by the Whitfield tiebreaker points, which is a margin of victory metric only in conference games. So in 6A, we've had two teams clinch playoff spots. Central Catholic clinched a spot with their win over Seneca Valley this past week. Um, and, you know, the, the scenarios here are pretty easy. The winner of the Cannon McMillan Mount Lebanon game makes the playoffs. Um, if Seneca Valley beats North Allegheny, they're in. If Seneca Valley loses, um, they are 
they are um, in if – wait, hold on a second. Sorry. <laughs> They're in if one team wins and out if one team loses. So, hold on. <laughs> I – I had it here and then I lost it because I was just talking. So let me pull this up. There is an article that I published on yeah. Sunday morning. On you know, Steel you can City refer Blitz. to com. the article. I, yes. Get yes. some people to the website there. Yes. You know? So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So Seneca Valley clinches a playoff spot with a win over North Allegheny or if Mount Lebanon loses, um, Canon Mac clinches a playoff spot with a win over Mount Lebanon or if Seneca Valley loses, Mount Lebanon has to beat Canon McMillan. Uh, to make the playoffs. Okay. In the Allegheny six conference in five, a remember only the top two are guaranteed spots. Bethel park has clinched a playoff spot. Uh, Peters township um, can finish no worse than third overall. Um, there is. And so remember two out of the three third place teams in five, a get a wild card spot. So it's possible they could be in contention for a wild card, but they haven't actually clinched a spot yet. Um, so this week, you know, Bethel park plays Peters, upper St. Clair plays South Fayette. So there's a lot of things that can happen. Um, those top four teams are all still in the mix for playoff spots. Um, a lot that can happen here this week, um, depending on, who wins and who loses and how it happens. I mean, you could wind up with if, you know, Peters beats Bethel and Upper St. Clair beats South Fayette, you'd have a three-way tie for first place, um, in which case all three of those teams would make the playoffs. So the third place team there would get a wild card. In the Big East Conference, um, this one is more wrapped up. Franklin Regional has clinched the conference title. Gateway is in second place. Um, Penn Trafford needs a win to finish third in the conference. Um, so the defending 5A state champs have to beat Franklin Regional this week to finish third. If they do, um, there is only one possible scenario where they could possibly miss the playoffs if they finish third. But in all likelihood, for the Penn Trafford folks watching, if you beat Franklin Regional, you most you're, likely you're will be in the yeah. playoffs. Yes. Yeah. But you have to beat Franklin Regional. If, if Penn Trafford loses... I'll say this. If Penn Trafford loses, not only are they out, but the Big East Conference cannot get one of the wild cards if Penn Trafford loses. So um, if Penn Trafford loses, then not only are they out, but the other two conferences will get the wild cards. And then the Northeast Conference, this one is the most wide open um, with wow. North Hills, Penn Hills, Pine Richland, and Woodland Hills all playing each other this week. Um, North Hills can finish no worse than third in the conference. Um, just because of how the tiebreakers all work out. Um, but, you know, if Pine Richland, basically the winner of North Hills Pine Richland will clinch a playoff spot. The winner of Penn Hills Woodland Hills clinches a playoff spot. And then it kind of just comes down to who finishes in third and if they have enough on the Gardner points and tiebreaker points to surpass one of the other third place teams to get in. Um, I will say because a lot of these teams have beaten each other, most likely – um, you know, the, the Northeast conference third place team will get a wild card spot. Um, it's yeah. I'll just say most likely <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Exactly. All right. On to I, the time that you, the time that you nail it down there, somebody you're going to get like half a dozen people telling you that you're wrong on social media. So, <laughs> well, this won't surprise you, but I have a spreadsheet uh. <laughs> That should be like my motto of the show. I uh, have a uh, uh, up to the fourth decimal point. So uh... pretty much. Yeah. Um, all right. Moving on to four a in the big seven <clears throat> conference. Um, the, the big showdown here, the, the four teams have clinched playoff spots. They're in everybody else is out. So um, nothing to be decided from a playoff spot standpoint, but the conference title is on the line with McKeesport taking on Thomas Jefferson. Uh, McKeesport would clinch the conference title with a win over TJ. Um, Thomas Jefferson would clinch the conference title if they win and Laurel Highlands loses. Um, now, if both TJ and Laurel Highlands win, there would be a three-way tie atop the conference. Um, so in that case, if Thomas Jefferson wins by nine points or more because of how the tiebreaker points work, then TJ would finish first. If TJ wins, but by eight points or fewer, McKeesport would finish first in the conference. So, you know, um, as a, as an, uh, you know, unbiased observer, um, to me, it, the conference championships are, I don't know, diluted uh, or just don't carry the meaning 
as around the other parts of the state. Just, you know, like I said, coming in from afar here. Um, yeah, because they're, especially this year when everything's really gotten reshuffled compared to conferences and class, uh, classes, it's like, wow. I mean, uh, these teams are like, okay, yeah, we won the conference title, but it's all about the Whippeo championship, not the conference championship. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, you're, you're absolutely right about that. Um, that being said though, um, the, the Whippeal does give out conference champion plaques to any team that finishes with the same record, regardless of tiebreaker. So if TJ were to beat McKeesport and Laurel Highlands beats Connellsville, which is very likely Connellsville's not very good. Um, then Laurel the school's Highlands, getting something they can put in their trophy case. Yes which would be the first conference championship ever for Laurel Highlands. Mm -hmm. So that would be a pretty cool accomplishment. Yeah. Um, You know, we, we had coach Colasar on a few weeks Mm -hmm. ago talking about how, you know, they had their goals were all still in front of them. And so they beat TJ a few weeks ago and now they have to root for TJ to beat McKeesport to get some hardware to put in their closet. uh, Sometimes that's what happens. Yep. All right, into the Greater Allegheny Conference. Armstrong clinched the conference title with that win over Highlands. Um, Two playoff spots still on the line here between North Catholic Hampton and Mars. Uh, That North Catholic Mars game will go a long way to deciding who makes it. North Catholic clinches a playoff spot with a win over Mars. Hampton clinches a playoff spot with a win over Highlands. If Mars beats North Catholic and Hampton loses to Highlands, it would be a three-way tie for the final two playoff spots. Um, which would come down to the tiebreaker points and then head to head between uh, flip a coin, schools. baby, flip a coin. They used to flip a coin. There was a year, there was a year that <laughs> West green Manesson, And I think it was Carmichael's or no, it was California. It was West green, California and Manesson tied for the tri-county south conference title and they were exactly even on every tiebreaker and they had the three head coaches had to go to the whip offices and flip a coin wow and the way they did the coin flip back then they've, they've since changed the procedure that now the committee just decides but um the the way or decides how to seed them basically but the way they did the coin flip was everybody flipped their coins and whoever had the different result was out, and then it was head to head. Whoever won the head to head game between the, the two teams with the same result. So whether it was like you know two people flipped heads, one person flipped tails, whatever it was. Um, and it, it and the crazy thing was, it took them like five or six flips to get someone with a different result. Like they kept tying oh on the coin flip. It was ridiculous. Yeah, it was it was nuts. Pretty rough. Yeah. All right. In the Parkway Conference, the five playoff spots have been determined, and we obviously have the massive showdown of the Titans between Central Valley and Aliquippa for the conference title this week. Um, you know, that's that's all that needs to be said because we spent the first half hour of the show talking about that game, and yeah. it's, it's going to be a doozy. All right, on to 3A. Freeport has wrapped up the conference title. Shadyside Academy, East Allegheny, and Deer Lakes have all clinched playoff spots. Congratulations to Deer Lakes for making the playoffs for just the third time in school history. Wow. And if you recall back to, our, back to our season preview show, that was my bold prediction that Deer Lakes would make the playoffs this year. So I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit there, too. Good job there. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. In the interstate conference, another massive showdown with the conference title on the line between Elizabeth forward and Bell Vernon. Bell Vernon moved down from 4A to 3A this year. Um, this game, I will say, is for the top seed in the 3A playoffs. Um, kind of like with 4A, I think that you know whoever wins this gets the top seed. Um, I think Avonworth gets the number two seed, and then whoever loses this game will probably get the number three seed, and I think Freeport will get the number four seed. Um, Mount Pleasant and Southmoreland also clinch playoff spots as well. They face off this week in a showdown of bitter neighboring rivals um, and, and just a great story for Southmoreland to make the playoffs this year after you know uh, their head coach tragically and unexpectedly passed away um, during this offseason. So great season for Southmoreland after a 40-year playoff drought ended in 2019. They've now made the playoffs in three out of the last four years. So really cool story for the Scotties there as they will be in search of their first playoff win in school history. Um, but, you know, have a rivalry game against Mount Pleasant first. And then in the Western Hills Conference, Avonworth has wrapped up the conference title. West Mifflin, a team that moved down from 4A to 3A this year and found some success, um, has clinched a playoff spot. 
Um, the other two playoff spots in this conference are between Beaver, South Park, and Hopewell. Beaver clinches the spot with a win over Hopewell. South Park clinches the spot with a win over West Mifflin. Um, Hopewell could clinch a playoff spot with a win over Beaver. And if South Park beats West Mifflin, um, if we wind up in a three-way tie where Hopewell beats Beaver and South Park loses to West Mifflin, um, then there uh, would be a tiebreaker. It would go to the tiebreaker points. Um, and then fourth place would be decided by head-to-head -head results. <laughs> okay, on to 2A. Uh, this got shaken up a little bit this yeah. past week with Sarah Catholic losing to Apollo Ridge, but not too much because... Um, you know, if Sarah goes out and beats Steel Valley, they'll still have the head to head tiebreaker um, for the top spot. So Sarah taking on Steel Valley with the conference title on the line. One more playoff spot to be decided here as five teams will make the playoffs out of this wow. conference. Um, Apollo Ridge would clinch the, that last playoff spot with a win over their rival Burl. Um, Amani Christian is the other team that could get that playoff spot and they would get it with a win over Yawk and an Apollo Ridge loss to Burl because Amani did beat Apollo Ridge head to head. Um, so since they have that head to head win, if they would both finish at three and four, Amani Christian would get the last spot. In the Century Conference, Keystone Oaks beat Washington last week, clinched a playoff spot, and prevented a casket match with Brentwood this week. Um, that if <laughs> KO had lost, it would have been a casket match, but they won. So they're in, um, and Brentwood is out. Um, so all four playoff spots in this conference have been decided. The only thing left to be decided here, um, McGuffey takes on Washington for who's going to be third and who's going to be fourth. Everything else is all set in stone there. And in the Midwestern Conference, uh, with Mohawks, uh, somewhat upset win over Western Beaver uh, yeah. last week. Beaver Falls clinched the conference title because Western Beaver lost. So congratulations to Beaver Falls on the conference title. And, uh, you know, some things to be decided in the middle of the pack here with Nishanik taking on Mohawk this week. Mohawk could actually get all the way up to second place in the conference with a win over Nishanik. Um, and then Western Beaver taking on Beaver Falls as well. Riverside has clinched the fifth and final playoff spot. They take on their arch rivals Elwood City this week, um, who's a program that's turned things around a little bit, snapped a long losing streak, both in mm. conference and overall. So Elwood City pointed in the right direction, um, but their rivals Riverside, who've really had their number over the last five years or so, um, are already in the playoffs. So Elwood City is just playing for that, that bragging rights against their rivals this week. On to 1A in the Big 7 Conference. The four playoff spots are wrapped up here. Laurel has clinched the conference title. Um, so that's, you know, everything's pretty pretty well pretty squared away yeah. here. Yep. Yeah, I think so. It, Bishop Canavan got that win over Olsh last week in the Black Hills Conference. Um, this is actually the only playoff spot remaining in 1A that is not decided. Um, Olsh takes on Cornell this week. Um, Fort Cherry, even though they're below Olsh in the standings, has clinched a playoff spot um, because uh, Fort Cherry has that head-to-head -head win over Cornell. So even if they wound up in a three-way tie scenario with Olsh, Cornell, and Fort Cherry all at four and three, um, Fort Cherry would still get one of those two playoff spots. Um, mm. But uh, Olsh is in a win-and-get-in situation this week against Cornell. Uh, but Cornell could clinch a playoff spot with a win over Olsh and if Fort Cherry beats Burgettstown. Um, so, you know, Cornell is, is not out of the water yet. Um, and uh, if Cornell beats Olsh, but Fort Cherry loses to Burgettstown, it's a three-way tie, which would come down to tiebreaker points and then head-to-head, -head, in which case Olsh would most likely get into the playoffs uh, one way or the other there. I'll say most likely, but yeah. All right. In the Eastern Conference, the four playoff teams have been decided, uh, but we do have a rivalry game between Clareton and Jeanette this week. Um, for our Aliquippa friends that may have been watching the show to see Coach Warfield's interview, um, Aliquippa is also chasing down Jeanette for the uh, title of most wins in Whippeal history. Um, they are five games behind, so every game Jeanette loses and Aliquippa wins is another you know game that Aliquippa yep. moves closer to Jeanette. Um, but also, the conference title here is still up for grabs. Greensburg Central Catholic would clinch it with a win over Leechburg, um, but Leechburg could win the conference title with either a win over Greensburg Central and a Clareton loss, or if Leechburg and Clareton both win, 
Um, it would wind up in a three-way tie scenario. Clareton could not win the conference title in that case, but Leechburg would need to beat Greensburg Central by nine points or more to win the conference title outright there. Um, if Leechburg wins, but by eight points or fewer, then Greensburg Central would technically win the conference title, wow. even though all three would still get conference champion plaques. And then finally in the Tri-County South, Mapletown wrapped up uh, the top spot in the conference and the conference title with their win over Manesson this past week. Um, and as things have worked out, we have two three-way ties here in the Tri-County South because why not? The Tri-County South is fun. Um, but, you know, the, the top tier will make the playoffs. The bottom tier will not. The four playoff spots are all wrapped up. Wow. So looking at our playoff clinchings overall and, and what's still left to be decided, um, you know, you can see there are, playoff spots remaining in every classification here heading into the final week of the season uh 10 conference or sorry seven conference titles still to be decided 10 have already been decided um and then you know uh, 13 other playoff spots remaining as well our games of the week i talked about a lot of them you know a lot of conference titles on the line a lot of games that are going to decide the last few playoff spots that should say week nine games of the week not week eight that's a copy paste error on my fault but um there was a lot of information to get in here so you know what you're looking at these are the best games of the week and i will have previews of all of them on steel city blitz com later in the week finally our whippy blitz top five overall teams we've been talking about this all year um you know a, a mammoth showdown this week between central valley and aliquippa and i will go i will go on the record on this show right now and i will say that whoever loses that game will not drop out of my top five oh, they, wow. they will they will stay in my top five regardless of the result of the game you know i've always taken this top five to be if you put two teams on a field together, who I would pick to win, and I would take Aliquippa against anyone, um, but Central Valley is right there too, and so is McKeesport. Yeah, um, and just to let the fans know, you and I were parallel here when we put these lists together. We, I mean, other than you get to see my list just because I have to text it to you, you know, when you put the show together, but I have no idea, you know, who uh, uh, who you're picking each week um and I mean, my uh, so, list this week's the same as last week because they all won but you right know, yeah well right but and for me i had highlands and they dropped out and bethel park you know moves up um but i tell you that's pretty strong showing uh by bethel park and north allegheny in 6a and whoever comes out of the mosh pit of 4a and the whip i mean is just going to be um, you know, as you touched on, is going to be battle hardened. They're going to be ready for just about anything. Um, yeah, uh, that any team from the rest of the state's going to can throw at them. I mean, so uh, yeah, I, I, I would, I would favor the Whippeal champ to win uh, in four A clearly um, in Cumberland Valley. Yes. Yep. So that is all for our show this week. Thank you everyone for joining us. This was awesome to have both coach Warfield and coach Lyons on. Um, as I mentioned, you know, you can check out my full breakdown of all the playoff scenarios on steelcityblitz.com. Um, you know, thanks everyone. Tell your friends about our show, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and thanks everyone for all your support this season. You know, we'll still be here. Uh, throughout the playoffs, breaking everything <clears throat> yeah. down as we move forward towards Whippeal championships and state championships. Uh, but it's been it's been a really fun season so far. We've gotten to interview some some really awesome people, um, and just to talk to those two coaches this week was was so cool. Yeah, and it and as you mentioned, I think it's only going to get better as we get into the postseason. And just for your edification and for the fans out there too, uh, we on Eastern PA football. Uh, the uh, Eastern show that I do with uh, Dave Micah and Joe Sandal Quito, we kind of adopted state college uh, into, you know, uh, into the fold there. And, and so uh, we did have a, an interview with uh, Scott Lentel uh, from state college. That is a must listen for you guys, because they're coming out West. I mean, you know, they're going to be uh, playing the Whitfield champ uh, to get to Cumberland Valley. So, or let's just say the Whitfield champs going to have to go through state college um, to, uh, uh, you know, get the Cumberland Valley, but also that same scenario as well is that the district three champion will play, uh, you know, uh, 
whoever comes out between District 6, which is going to be State College, and the Whitfield champ there, too. So it's really starting to take shape. And I would definitely, um, uh, you know, watch that interview with with Scott Linthal. I mean, State College, I've seen them in person. Um, they play multiple styles of play. They can basically do what they want to do. And those teams are the ones that are dangerous. Yeah. And it seems like State College is always a, a perennial contender that, like, you know, they get into the state playoffs and make it to like the quarterfinals or the semifinals, but not really past there. So, um, you know, kind of cool to see them having a good season too. And I agree as we get into things here, you know, moving down the stretch and into the Whitfield playoffs, you know, keeping an eye on who's progressing in the state brackets is always important too. Um, and I will say, you know, easternpafootball.com does a great job with their state brackets. They'll have, um, you know, full graphics full bra- there's full yeah, right full of, brackets of, and graphics and everything of the state brackets like starting with the first round of the whip playoffs that you can see kind of okay here's the whip portion of the bracket here's how they're moving forward and here's how everyone else is coming forward too dave's so got them up already i mean he's got all of the brackets up there already so you can see how it's all gonna fit together even like this week so really good stuff definitely yeah. check that out on easternpfootball.com it's right on the front page yes Absolutely. So thanks everyone for joining us, not only this week, but, but all season on the show. Um, you know, we, we really appreciate everyone's support. It's been a, it's been an awesome season. Um, and you know, I'm really looking forward to the the stretch run here into the playoffs. Um, you know, it's the, the last week of the regular season, but there's still a lot to be decided. So, um, you know, follow me on Twitter at Whippio underscore blitz. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll be, tweeting a whole lot this Friday night about who's, yeah. who's in, who's out, who's in position to make the playoffs and all that. Yeah, no, you're, you're a great follow there, Ian. So yeah, listen, thanks for watching the show. Now's when things really start to ramp up. So for Ian McMeans, I'm Bruce Badgley. Check us out on the WPIAL Blitz Show next week as well. See ya.